Okay, it's five o'clock. We have May the peace of Christ be with you. Greetings once again. It is now the time. It's the moment we've all been waiting for. The Presbyterian Peacemaking Program has been waiting for this dinner since probably last August when we hatched this wonderful thought that maybe on the ghost of a chance, Mrs. Marion Wright Edelman would come and address peacemakers of the Presbyterian Church. For those of you who aren't familiar with Mrs. Edelman, she is the founder of the Children's Defense Fund and its president. The Children's Defense Fund began in 1973. In February of 2003, it will have been in existence for 30 years working to ensure that this world is a safer and more equitable and just place for our children. We are so grateful for her witness and her presence. Her list of accomplishments, awards, and honors are too numerous to mention in this time, and I don't want to do that because I want you to be able to hear the wisdom and the challenge that she has for us and for our church at this time. Without further uh, delay, let us welcome Marion Wright Edelman, president and founder of the Children's Defense Fund. Here's water oh, thank you very much. I want to thank Sarah. Thank you. thank you. If anybody told me 30 years ago almost that it would be so hard to get this country to do what is right for children, I wouldn't have believed it. But I want to thank you tonight because you're so encouraging with your year of the child. And by the end of this decade for the child, we're going to have a new America where every child is welcome at the table. So I thank all of you for your work your work for peace, for peace with justice. And Mr. Gandhi said a long time ago, if we're really going to have peace in the world, we have to begin with our children. So it is all integrated. And I thank you for what you've been doing for children. And I thank you for what you're going to do for children as we attempt to build a movement. Very proud that we have a Presbyterian minister as our religious action coordinator, Becky Davis, whom many of you have seen. If you haven't seen her, go see her at the exhibit booth. Stand up, Becky. Um, but we're very glad, and I also, we're blessed to have the best head of the Children's Defense Fund Ohio and Eileen Cooper-Reed, and any of you who are from Ohio, we're just two blocks away, and she lives in Cincinnati as well, but Eileen Cooper-Reed. But I am so honored to be here with you. Imagine a very wealthy family with five young children. Four have enough to eat and comfortable rooms in which to sleep, one does not. She's often hungry and lives in a cold room. Sometimes she has to sleep on the streets in a shelter and even be taken away from her family and be placed in foster care with strangers. Imagine this family giving four of their very young children nourishing meals every day but letting the fifth child go hungry. Imagine this very wealthy family making sure that four of their young children get all their shots and regular checkups before they get sick, but ignoring the fifth child who is plagued by chronic infections and respiratory diseases like asthma. Imagine this rich family making sure that four of their children get stimulating preschool experiences and sending the fifth child to unsafe or poor quality child care with underpaid or untrained caregivers responsible for too many children or leaving that child all alone. 
Imagine the family reading every night to four of their children and leaving the fifth child unread to, untalked to, unsung to, or propped before a television screen which feeds her violence, ads for material things, and intellectual pablum. As the children grow up, imagine this family sending four of them to good schools and safe neighborhoods with enough books and computers and laboratories and science equipment and well-prepared teachers, but sending the fifth child to crumbling school buildings with peeling ceilings and leaks and asbestos in the paint and old books and not enough of them, with teachers untrained in the subjects they teach and funding unequal to those in richer school districts. Imagine four of the family's children growing up excited about learning, looking forward to finishing high school, going on to college and getting a job, and the fifth child who comes to school not ready to learn, falling farther behind grade level when unable to read and keep up with classmates, wanting to drop out of school and at risk of getting pregnant or into trouble. Imagine four of the children becoming engaged in sports and music and arts enrichment after school and in the summer months and service opportunities in the fifth child as she gets older, meeting her friends on the streets or going home alone because mom and dad have to work or have escaped parenting responsibilities they feel unable to meet in drugs and alcohol and hanging out alone with peers all summer. This is a portrait of our American family today where one in five of our youngest children under three lives in poverty, it is not a stable or a healthy family or a sufficiently compassionate one, which is why we're gathered here. What do we know about America's fifth child? Contrary to popular stereotypes, that fifth poor young child is much more likely to live in a working family than to be on welfare, and we've got to make work pay, and that's what the welfare debate is about this year. It's got to be not about getting people off welfare. It's got to be about getting people out of poverty, and so your voice can make a difference. That fifth child is more likely to be white than black or Latino and is more likely to live in a rural or suburban area than in, in, in a city. We've just issued a new report, the Children's Defense Fund on Child Poverty from the new census data, and we pointed out that many of the poorest counties in America are rural counties, and in some places in South Dakota and across, in fact, in Cleveland, you've got 38% of the children poor, but in some counties, 50 and 60% in our rural areas of children and families who are poor. Poverty is all of us and it is everywhere. Um, it's suburban and inner city and rural. Three in, in five of our poor children are white, although black and Latino children suffer far more than their share of poverty. And it's disgraceful that one in three of all black children and one in four Latino children is poor. Poverty robs children's lives of education and health and hope and dreams. It even takes their lives. America's fifth child is twice as likely to be born without adequate prenatal care low, at low birth weight and to die before her first birthday. America's fifth child is more than twice as likely to be abused or neglected and three times as likely to live in substandard housing as non-poor children. And we've got to stop getting used to shelters as places where children grow up. We need to close down shelters and give children stable homes. And so we really need to pay attention because if you don't have a place called home or a place to go to every night, it's going to make it very difficult, but that's one of the big problems associated with poverty. And we're not really having a serious housing debate, though we really do have provisions in the Act to Leave No Child Behind, which I will talk about in a very short time. America's fifth child will not grow or develop as fast as other children physically, mentally, or educationally. It's twice as likely to repeat a grade or drop out of school before graduation to require special education and to end up on welfare and in trouble than non-poor children. A child who is our fifth child is more likely to begin school already thousands of words behind her middle class peers because she's not read to, doesn't have books in her house, is not talked to often, 
because mothers are out trying to work and make a living, has not provided a quality child care, preschool, or a Head Start or an early Head Start experience in our top priority next year when the Head Start bill comes up for reauthorization is to see that every eligible child gets a Head Start and that all rather than just 5% get an early Head Start. And to have any of our leaders tell us, as they're telling us this year, that we can't afford to send a single new child to Head Start, which is what the Bush administration's budget says. And next year that we're not gonna be able to afford to give our children a Head Start, we need to say nonsense. We need to change our nation's priorities. Something is wrong with the valleys of a nation that would rather spend $30,000, $40,000 to lock a child up after they get into trouble and won't spend $5,000 to get them ready for school through Head Start. We must change that. America's fifth child suffers more than her share of asthma attacks and respiratory ailments and lead poisoning without getting treated. Often can't sleep at night because there are too many people and too much noise in the shelters and is frequently tired in preschool, tired in preschool. That fifth child is worn down, fighting a chronic multi-front war against sickness, family breakdown, family and neighborhood violence, drugs, fear and shame, struggling to get attention at home and at school. He's tired from trying to keep spirits up and to hang on to a tenuous sense of being somebody worthwhile going somewhere better. That fifth child is less likely to have a father at home, and I believe in fathers as well as in mothers, and the best thing you can do to encourage marriage is to make sure that there are good jobs so that people can support to support a family. Benjamin Franklin said it a whole long time ago that the best impetus to marriage is a sound job. So we need to talk about values, but we also need to talk about economic opportunity and not have one be a substitute for the other. This parent, this child deserves and all children need the support of both parents, the stability of family with a steady income, and they need significant family and community incomes. Nobody raises a child alone. And one of the things I was so grateful for in my growing up is that I had my own parents, but my church was an extended family, and we had all these community elders, and everybody used to tell on everybody because everybody had a collective sense of ownership about children. And we've got to get back to that again. Because otherwise, that child is put on a trajectory of failure. And so the question is, how do the people of God raise a voice for this poor child? But I want to say before I move on to that, is that it's not just poor children who are in trouble today, because drugs and alcohol abuse and children who are afflicted by the poverty of too much, what I call affluenza, are also at risk, and they are often facing the sense that life is about having things, and they're often abandoned by parents who are too much preoccupied with having their own times, and so we really do have to figure out how we focus and put our children first. America's fifth child um, is there because this country chooses not to see and invest in all of its children. If our children lived in other countries, other industrialized countries, they would be much less likely to be poor. They'd be much better off if they were living in France or in England, which are nowhere near as rich as our own nation. And if our fifth child lived in 23 other industrialized nations, he would be guaranteed health insurance, an income safety net, and the chance for a parent to stay at home with pay after childbirth. And I don't understand us because we know about the importance of the early years and rapid brain development and the cost effectiveness. What is it about us, people of faith? What is it about us, Americans, who say we believe in equal opportunity where we won't do the right thing at the time when we know it's the most cost effective and it makes the greatest difference to our children's development? And I really hope we can force our nation to grapple with it about why is it that we let so many children be left behind when we know what to do, we know what works, and when it saves money. And so I hope that we will try to figure out that why and change it. And we need to personalize these children and let people understand that these are not just about statistics of children being born into poverty every 43 seconds um, or being born without health insurance every minute. These are real children. And I was very moved by a story that occurred, or a tragedy that occurred within the last month, 
that was very movingly written about by a reporter in St. Louis. And let me just share it, share that story with you. It's the story about a nine-year-old little girl who had come to this country with her mother, and they ran into a tragedy. Her name was Dejanka Clergy, and heroic efforts were made by many people to save her life. She was living in a house where there were 11 people sleeping in a two-family dwelling when it caught fire on April 10th. She was the last to wake up because she didn't hear the scream. She was deaf. A firefighter carried her smoldering body to the ambulance. A helicopter carried her to a state-of-the-art burn unit. Surgeons placed a tube in her throat, and they worked on her, including amputating her legs, but she could not survive. She got the very best treatment that the wealthiest nation on earth had to offer, but she died. The question is, what could we have done about her plight earlier, and what could we have done to prevent her death. We've got so many people who are trying to play by the rule and, and are working, and her mother was one of them. She was hardworking. Rosemarie Chantal had moved here from Haiti to put her toddler in a world-renowned school for the deaf, but only to have a marital breakup and a language barrier throw her into the kind of poverty that set this tragic tale into motion. Um, it's a new kind of improved American poverty. The post-1996 welfare reform poverty where single mothers of children faced demanding menial jobs, earning just enough money to lose many government benefits but not enough to pay the bills. And unable to make ends meet without adequate assistance, this child's mother had lighted a candle because the children were afraid of the dark. And so because she hadn't had the money to pay her utilities bill, she had lighted a candle, and she had forgotten to snuff it out. Again, the strains of life of many poor parents. This is a child who died from poverty, which we could have prevented with basic assistance to working poor parents in this country, and no child should be at risk of these kinds of problems, utility shutoffs, hunger, and lack of health care, which affects so many millions of our families, and it is a part of what we have got to change as our Congress and our leaders debate the 1996 welfare law and as we seek to make sure that parents are not worn out because they lack the most basic supports like child care and health care and decent housing. I think that September 11th, beckons us all to think differently about the kind of nation and world we want to build for our children, all of them. We need to change direction. We need to recover a sense of urgency about saving our babies. We need to redefine the measure of American success and make sure that principles of justice rather than power and money and militarism guide our feet and national priorities. But it will not happen unless you and I build together a powerful movement to leave no child behind that bubbles up from every nook and cranny in America, from every congregation in America to transform the political and economic priorities in a nation and a world that has turned a deaf ear to the cries of children and stack the decks in favor of the rich and powerful. And you and I must say that need must be met before greed. I don't begrudge anybody their first, fifth, or tenth million or billion if they are earned on a fair playing field and after children's crucial survival needs are met. But something is out of kilter when just three of our wealthiest Americans possess greater wealth than seven million American families combined and the revenues of 19 state governments with 25 million citizens. They and others in the top 1% of wealthiest Americans with an average income over a million dollars did not need the huge tax cut the Bush administration and Congress gave them in June 2001. 
and they do not need those tax cuts accelerated and make permanent. The idea that we are sitting here talking about repealing the estate tax cut in a period of recession when you've got millions of hungry children, thankfully the Senate rejected that last week, it'll come up again, but what in the world has happened to us in terms of what's important and how can anybody be standing up and arguing to make permanent um, these budget proposals, while there are still millions of hungry and homeless and poor and uninsured and poorly educated children. Now, we've been up on the Hill arguing for $20 billion increase for child care to change from one in seven, those able to get child care, to two in seven. This is hardly a big, huge step forward, but it would help two more million children be safe when their parents work particularly at a time when many of our leaders are demanding that mothers work 40 hours rather than 30 hours a week. Who's going to take care of the children? But they're telling us we can't afford $20 billion at the same time. They're sitting here and refusing to talk about freezing tax cuts for the very wealthiest. We just issued a report on the tax cut. And one of the things we've got to do, because I don't believe that the American public is aware of what is in this tax bill, is not aware of what our choices are, and that when we know what our choices are, we will do the right thing. And if we had to choose between millionaires and billionaires and hungry children and educated children and children who have health care, I think we'll do the right thing. So one of the things I really hope is that we will go out and educate ourselves and our congregations and our communities, and we will answer the notion that we don't have the money to invest in our children. Of course we have the money. We don't have a money's problem. We have a values problem and a priorities problem, and that's what we're going to have to change. I hope we can share with you just the facts of the report that we issued, because we did an analysis of the tax cut and who benefits and had Bob McIntyre, who's brilliant, of the Citizens for Tax Justice, and let me just share four of our findings, and I never quite get used to it because there had not been a breakdown on the year-by-year -year cost of the tax cuts, just the top 1%, people with an average income over a million dollars, and here's what the basic finding is. From 2001 to 2010, the wealthiest 1% of Americans, with incomes over a million dollars on average, will pocket a half trillion dollars from the tax cuts. Each member of this elite group will average $342,000 in tax cuts over the decades. In fact, by the time you end up and look at the charts, the top 1% of millionaires um, with an average income of 1.1 will get 52% of the entire tax cut. I don't know any standard of justice that would justify this. And by 2010, when the tax cuts take full effect, and most of us who have already are not in that top 1%, um, well, we've already gotten most of what we're going to get. So we're proposing that we freeze the rest, the, the, the top, just like we have frozen most of the others. And rather than freezing child care and Head Start children, that we ought to be freezing the wealthiest. But by the time we get to 2010, you will find that the top 1% will get $121 billion just in that one year, which is 120, 80 times, 180 times bigger than the tax cuts for the bottom 60% of Americans earning less than $59,000 a year. And in fact, that top 1% in 2010 will get 85000 each on average. That's about what, that's four and a half times what the average child care worker makes. Um, in a year. We need to debate these priorities. We need to challenge the fact that we don't have money. And so one of the things that the Children's Defense Fund is going to be trying to do, and we need your help, is to educate people. We really need to educate people about the fact that the money is there. It's about where we're going to put it. And we really do need to say, rather than invest in the tax cuts for the wealthiest and the truly non-needy, Let's provide early childhood programs for every child who needs them to get ready for school. We have drafted the Comprehensive Act to Leave No Child Behind. It was introduced last year by Senators Dodd and Miller. We have about 13 Senate co-sponsors, 83 House co-sponsors. I hope you'll get every one of your people on it. Many senators and congressmen have said we can't afford to do it because it will cost $75 billion a year to lift every child from poverty, to give every child and their parent health care, to provide early childhood, to help families who are trying to work get the supports they need. It's a bargain, and it is less than that 
tax cut for the top 1%. So I just hope we can start a debate about where we ought to be investing our resources to create a fair America. I think we should be lifting our children from homelessness and the act to leave no child behind, to provide a million new housing vouchers to deal with struggling families, many of whom are working but who cannot afford rent and utilities. It will provide every child after school care. And I'm so grateful that many of the religious denominations have endorsed the act and the movement to leave no child behind. And we should not confuse it with President Bush's No Child Left Behind bill. That is a single issue education reform bill which will do something but it has nothing to do with health care and poverty and housing. And so it's, this is the truly comprehensive act to leave no child behind. And over the next decade, we should make it a reality for every child, and we can do that, but only if we build a powerful movement to leave no child behind. Many of you know Reverend Eileen Lynn, and she's another Presbyterian minister who we have, who's helped guide our religious action program down at, um, at the Children's Defense Fund, and she told a wonderful story down at the Proctor Institute um, about going to get her car serviced at the Jiffy Lube in New Jersey, and she was left to read or choose between field and stream and a manual on how to become a, get your driver's license if you were a boat owner. And she chose to go through the manual about how to get your license as a boat owner. And she was thumbing through it, she ran into a section entitled, The Rules of the Open Seas. And it described two types of vessels, burden boats and privilege boats. Burden boats are like rowboats or sailboats, and some of you know the logo of the Children's Defense Fund, the little boat that's facing the big ocean, and often these boats are pretty leaky, they don't have good health and don't have education. We don't give our children the sails they need to get to safe harbor. Burden boats don't have any power, and they're at the mercy of the tide and wind and of human effort. Privileged boats, on the other hand, have motors. They can accelerate and decelerate, change direction, and weather the breaking waves. And what the manual said is that when on open seas, the privileged boat meets the burden boat, the privileged boat must give way so that the burden boat can make it to safe harbor. Now, if the New Jersey Department of Transportation can figure that out, <laughs> I would think the people of God could help our nation figure that out. And that's what this debate is about. So what can we do? Let's just commit ourselves to building a movement to leave no child behind. I, you know, if, if our leaders are going to use these words, we have to make them real. We want to make honest people of our leaders. And we need to distinguish between charity and justice, as I said earlier today. And I believe in charity, and I believe in service, and I believe that faith-based congregations ought to be doing more and reaching out and keeping those doors open to compete with the gang dealers and the drug dealers. But service and charity can be taken away at any time. They are the gift of the giver. A child's right to live, to be safe from violence, to have basic food and shelter and education is, is a justice issue. And that is the human right of our children everywhere. And if Jesus, Jesus was about justice. Jesus was about trying to challenge the cultures and the priorities of the day and of the principalities, and so must we. And I love to think about how we build the witness to make our great nation fulfill its promises to all of our children. And one of the ways we want to do that is through something called Wednesdays in Washington and at home. And we want to see Presbyterian Wednesdays. And let me just tell you, the Methodists have had a good month of Wednesdays. And I know we're not going to let the Methodists, I'm a Baptist, and I'm trying to get the Baptists to catch up with the Methodists. But the Methodist women came about three Wednesdays ago and brought six, seven, eight thousand petitions. Um, to members of Congress to say let's invest in child care and in lifting children from poverty through work supports for their parents. And then two Wednesdays ago, um, the AME women came, the African Methodist Episcopal women. That's the second time they've come on a Wednesday. They came to launch the bill and they went around and they lobbied before and they were treated rather rudely by one senator um, who um, 
when he got back home, he knew he was in for it. He came on this bill. He promised him earlier that he was going to co-sponsor, and then he kind of didn't get around to it. Well, he got around to it because they were fit to be tied that he had not kept his commitment. And last Wednesday, 14 Methodist bishops came to provide a witness on the day of the debate of the repeal of the estate tax and to say, yes, we can afford child care. Our members of the Finance Committee and to the White House, they also went. And so we want to have a Presbyterian Wednesday commitment. Um, but it's really based on two things, a New Testament parable that I know many of you know about, which described an unjust, powerful judge who ignored a, par a powerless widow's plea for justice. But she didn't give up. And because this widow keeps bothering me, this judge said, I will grant her justice so that she may not continue coming forever and wear, us, wear me out. So I think we've got to wear out our leaders until they hear our voices and feel our votes and, and provide just treatment for our children. So we are really on every Wednesday somewhere in America trying to get emails and calls and visits. We need to adopt every Presbyterian senator and member of the House of Representatives and let them know that we are watching how they treat our children. And each year, out of our comprehensive act to leave no child behind, we'll pick one or two specific goals. And I hope you're going to go to the exhibit hall. Becky's down there. And you're going to get on the computer and send emails right now because the members of the Senate Finance Committee and the Senate are going to be deciding how much child care is available for working parents over the next five years. If many of the Bush administration's proposals prevail, we'll have 114,000 fewer children able to get child care, but we've got members of both parties who are supporting $11.2 billion as a first step toward our $20 billion goal in the Senate Finance Committee, and I'll just tell you, we need that mandatory money for child care. So I hope you will, before you leave here, go and send messages to your representative saying support child care for working parents and support $11.2 billion in the Senate Finance Committee. Um, that kind of persistent witness each Wednesday, if we keep at it, and they come home on Wednesdays and they hear from us, and they sort of get these emails, I think we can begin to move ahead. Next year, Head Start's going to come up for reauthorization, and we just want to make sure that they don't mess with Head Start, that rather than narrowing it down into a narrow literacy program, that we maintain as comprehensive services, and that we see that every eligible child gets a Head Start. If you look at some of the budgets this year, you will see that not a single new child could get a head start. We want to change that. So I hope you will talk to Becky Davis about how you can be a Wednesday in Washington participant and a Wednesday at home participant. It makes a difference. And we want to have a big fun Wednesday in February um, as part of our national conference. And we want to have a Jericho Wednesday. We just think we need to sort of have people come but we just need to march around those walls until they come crumbling down for our children. And we've been practicing new forms of public witness. Um, we had a baby stroller day, and we we're going to have a baby stroller Wednesday on July 10th. The first time the children were very well behaved in the House Budget Committee, but maybe next time we will not feed them and let them really understand about how painful hungry children. But I hope we can have fun. But I hope we can have a persistent witness, but basically send a message that our children have to be taken care of. Second, I hope we will do our homework and educate people because we have the means, and from those to whom much has been given, much is expected. We have been so blessed, and I hope that through America, the children of the world can be blessed. Third, I hope we will practice the highest form of patriotism by helping and asking others to ask hard questions and helping to honor our nation's highest ideals. We should love God and justice so much and our country that we raise our voices to help our nation honor the ideals of freedom and justice for which we purport to stand. Like Albert Camus, I should like to be able to love my country and still love justice. He said, I don't want just any greatness for it, particularly a greatness born of blood and falsehood. I want to be able to love my country because it lives up to her ideals. And that's the way I feel about our country today. And we can do that. So I hope you will join with us um, over the next years and 
Until we get us to respond, there are a lot of people who are waiting for Mahatma Gandhi or for Dr. King to come back. They're not coming back. We're it. And we've got to get about the business of doing what we've got to do with what we have. And our collective voice is what, and our collective struggle, is what will transform our nation and save our children. It's very hard work. Um, I remember Mr. Breck, the, play, the German writer, saying, there are those who struggle for a day, and they are good. He said, there are those who struggle for a year, and they are better. But there are those who struggle all of their lives, and they are the indispensable ones, and the people of Christ and of God are to be the indispensable ones. And it's about struggling for what is right, always being hopeful, always being there, and so let me end with a prayer because we can't all do everything, but I've been saying this prayer a lot because it takes a lot of praying in Washington these days. And it's called, I pray, I care and I'm willing to serve. And so we shouldn't think about what we can't do, let's think about what we can do and what our faith dictates that we do. Lord, I can't preach like Dr. King or turn a poetic phrase like Maya Angelou, but I care and I'm willing to serve. I don't have Fred Shuttlesworth's or Harriet Tubman's courage or Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt's political skills. But I care and I'm willing to serve and to stand with others to build a movement to leave no child behind. I wish I could sing like Miss Fannie Lou Hamer or organize like Byatt Rustin, I can't. But I can care and I'm willing to serve and I'm willing to organize and vote with others for our children. I'm not holy like Archbishop Tutu or forgiving like President Mandela or disciplined like Gandhi, but I care and I'm willing to serve and to do whatever I can to build a powerful movement to leave no child behind. I'm not brilliant like Dr. Du Bois or Elizabeth Cady Stanton or as eloquent as Booker T. Washington, but I care and I'm willing to serve and to stand with others for justice for our children. I don't have Mother Teresa's saintliness or Dorothy Day's love or Cesar Chavez's gentle, tough spirit, but I care and I'm willing to serve and I'm willing to keep struggling with others to achieve justice for our children. God is not as easy as the 60s to frame an issue and forge a solution, but I care and I'm willing to serve. My mind and body are not so swift as in youth, and my energy comes in spurts. But I care, and I'm willing to serve and to use the time and energy I have to speak up and vote for our children. So many of our young people say, I'm so young. Nobody's going to listen. I'm not sure what to say or to do. And as adults and people of faith, we need to provide them opportunities and, and examples of standing up to make our democracy work for them and teach them that they can say, I care, and I'm willing to serve. Many people say, I can't see or hear well. I don't speak good English. I stutter sometimes, and I get real scared standing up before others. That's all right. We can say, I care, and I'm willing to serve and to come together with others to build a movement to leave no child behind. And I hope as each of you who already have shown and expressed your commitment to children and as you go forward with the decade of the child over the next years, I hope you will ask God to use me and use you as God wills to save God's children today and tomorrow and to build a nation and a world where no child is left behind and every child feels welcome. What good does it do America to lead the world in millionaires and billionaires to have the largest military budget in the world and we lose our soul? So this mission and this movement to leave no child behind is about everything that is important as people of faith. And so I look forward to you and to working with you and to partnering with you to build that moral witness that will make our country live up to what God calls us all to do and to be. So thank you very much. Mrs. Edelman. You have taken time out of what I know 
is a very busy schedule working with very important people to um, work on behalf of the world's children and this nation's children. The peacemaking program would like to give you a small token of our appreciation for your willingness to be present with us. And I would challenge you as peacemakers. Many of you know that peacemaking, the Believer's Calling, made three important affirmations. One, the church is faithful to Jesus Christ when it is engaged in peacemaking. Two, the church is obedient to Jesus Christ when it nurtures and equips God's people as peacemakers. And three, and most importantly, the way you can give a gift to Mrs. Edelman and the Children's Defense Fund, the church bears witness to Jesus Christ when it nourishes the moral life of our nation for the sake of peace in this world. So I challenge you as a thank you to Mrs. Edelman's presence with us this evening and in the assembly this afternoon. Write those letters, contact your officials, work with our colleague. Is Catherine Gordon still here in the Washington office? Catherine Gordon in the Washington office. Eleanor Giddings Ivory. That is the greatest gift we as a church can give to our nation's children. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.